mute every attendees. So hopefully you don't have uh, have better audio now. Um, so also feel free to, to ask questions on the Q&A. There's a little Q&A uh, box there that you can ask questions. I'll try to address them as I do this, and then it, in, a, in the end, um, I'll basically um, go back to the questions you guys asked. So just a, a quick uh, where is the next slide? Here? Overview of security innovation. Uh, basically, we are uh, a company focused on application security. Um, we've been around for quite a while. Um, in some ways, we've done quite a bit of products and services and, and training in the past. And, and a lot of the focus now is on the, the e-learning uh, part of the of you know application security. We have a couple of interesting products coming along, which I'll, I'll talk about in a bit. And we also have a pretty good application security team who does source, you know, basically security analysis. And we have uh, a really powerful crypto uh, product, which is kind of outside the scope of this, but it's kind of one of the interesting things that we also do here. And we kind of work with a lot of companies to basically help them to reduce their vulnerabilities and embed application security into their software development lifecycle. So kind of what I want to do here is uh, I'm going to go to kind of how you think about application security. Uh, I want to cover kind of the OWASP top 10 because I think it's a it's a really good um, overview of the type of security issues that exist, and and it's something that you guys should really be kind of aware of. And if you don't know about it, then you know you should definitely um, be um, you know getting your head around how it works. And it's kind of the the, the sort of uh, great um, kind of resource that you can give on to all um, your developers. And then I want to do a whole bunch of demos, some focus on web application uh, security, and then uh, that's it. So the, the first thing I, I kind of want to think about application security is um, you have to learn as much as possible about what's being used. Right? In some ways, the, the, one, of the, one of the differences between application security and, and network security is that you have to understand the application, which actually means that you have to understand the code, which basically means you have to understand the frameworks that people are using. You, know, you cannot have a, a decent conversation with the people on the other side if you're doing application security if you don't understand the technologies and the frameworks and basically the world they live in. So you kind of have to learn as much as possible. And it, it, in some ways, it's a never-ending race. You know, you always have to learn because there's new things coming on, new frameworks, new languages. So you kind of have to uh, always keep up on that one. And of course, new vulnerabilities, new exploit techniques, etc. cetera. Um, you also have to kind of understand the attack surface. Uh, and, and this is sort of very important because um, the attack surface is kind of what makes you bring some sanity to the amount of stuff you need to analyze. Because in some ways, from a security point of view, we kind of care about the stuff that can go wrong. Um, and, and in some ways, the attack surface um, gives you that, right? Or, or just for a little spell mistake. So it's not the assets, it's the assets, right? The next one is basically what you want to do in some ways as part of you mapping the attack surface is you are also um, finding the assets that matter to a company and finding the assets that basically you need to be protecting. And again, this is very relevant because ultimately the assets is what matters. You know, like you, if you, maybe you need to protect some credit cards. Maybe you need to protect some user information. Maybe you need to protect the fact that the information needs to be available. Those are all assets that um, you, need to be, you need to capture, you need to understand. And of course, that, that's also tied to the company's risk appetite. You know, some companies are very comfortable to have a huge amount of security vulnerabilities that exploit certain types of their world because it's not relevant to their business model or is something that they can live with, but other parts are become very critical. And, and sometimes without understanding the company's business model, it's hard to fully understand, you know, how bad something is or how something should be remediated. Now, of course, the next part is you have to think about how the application works, not just what it does. And, and, and in some ways, this is where you have um, a big difference between normal uh, security and QA and testing, because and, and in some ways the world of developing, because most development and QA focus on how the on what the application does. Does it do, basically does it do what I want it to do? Does it behave the way I expect it to behave? What it doesn't, what sometimes we don't focus on or they don't focus on is how it actually works and everything that's possible to be able to do. And in some ways, you know, you might have an application that does exactly what the 
the, you know, the people who bought it wants it and the users want it, but you can do a lot more. The SQL injection, for example, is a good example of a vulnerability that under normal circumstances doesn't affect the behavior of the application in most cases, but allows in some ways an attacker to do a lot more um, or than, than what would be expected. So in some ways, focus on how the application works is absolutely critical because um, it's, it's basically a way to really visualize, you know, if you're going back to the attack surface, the assets, and et cetera. Now, the other big part, and I'm pretty big on this one, is we also have to automate application security knowledge. So we kind of have to capture um, security knowledge that was created during the engagements and then give that to developers because that's also um, a great way to make it invisible. So basically to make it so that most of the time the developers don't understand, don't need to understand security because um, we kind of put it under the hood and they code in a secure way kind of by default. So, so how do you kind of approach it, right? You know, how, what's your workflow on when you're doing application security testing? How do you actually um, go about it? So kind of usually you, you sort of, you know, you, you start by exploring, doing exploratory testing to kind of understand how it works within the environment and gives it clues how it might break. A really powerful thing is threat modeling. And, you know, given kind of, you know, t if you take it with a pinch of salt, right, and don't go overboard, um, threat modeling can be really, really powerful because it allows you to ask a huge amount of questions and, and allows to understand um, basically how the app works from a, from a threat point of view. Um, once you have that information, you kind of plan for your testing, figure out the test case that you want to do, what you want to test for, and then you execute a test and perform the planned tests and, and report your findings. Um, now, when, when you talk about exploratory testing, Right? It's basically we're trying to figure out, you know, if you go back to the point I said before, like the attack surface, what you do, what's the inputs and the outputs, um, how does it actually um, work, and and basically, you know, what kind of, tech, like say, technology you can use, et cetera. So, and ideally, you, you kind of already start doing this with automated and manual tools, and, and, and also, ideally, you should also want to have access to the source code, so you, you have a much better picture of what's going on. Then, you know, the, the threat modeling exercise, I, it's, it's always one of my favorites when we can do it because it's where you can actually usually test a huge amount of your assumptions, like without even touching the application. It's where you basically start to think about what can go wrong on the application. What's um, the things that an attacker might be able to do? Um, how does it work? You know, uh, what's the kind of stuff that can go wrong? And, and here's kind of important to understand the difference between a threat and a vulnerability, right? The threat is something that could happen, and a vulnerability is actually when something can actually happen. So in some ways, uh, vulnerabilities are unmitigated threats, right? You, you know, you could always have a threat of saying, well, the attacker might be able to manipulate the database because there is a database, but you might have mitigating controls that actually prevent that from happening. And, um, and again, wh what I like about the threat modeling is the fact that it forces you to ask in some ways, the right questions. It forces you to go through the steps of understanding the attack surface and, and et cetera. And there's a pretty cool tool, which I'll cover in a second, about it. So when, when you do the threat profile, you know, just recapping on what I just said, you know, you identify the assets, you, you go through the threads, you, would, you realize the kind of attacks that could realize the threads, and then what conditions need to be made, right? And, and, and making a, basically a threat um, kind of model based on the attack, again, makes it, the whole thing much more realistic. You know, like, the way I look at it is if you spend more than a day or two doing a threat modeling, you already lost the plot, right? You, you're mapping far too much, you're going far too deep, right? Uh, you know, because you, you could basically go crazy, right? You could spend a week doing a threat modeling. But I, th I think that the, the key point when I look at threat modeling is it's almost to understand um, how the app works, and, and actually another big nice thing is I also use it to understand how much the developers and the people on the other side understand about the security profile, which is also very interesting. You can't really document this, but, you know, by the way people answer, by the way people kind of react to certain questions you make, you get a really great feel for how much they, they thought about security, how much they consider it, if there's anybody who actually has gone through the steps of, you know, basically building this, a security app, a secure app on the other side. Now, 
there's a great thread modeling tool from Microsoft. There's, there's basically there's a couple, right, that you kind of want to play with. Uh, and again, they you know, absolutely recommend them, go through them, um, and then use them as kind of a way to capture your information. And, and also, because some of them are, you know, have like an XML uh, schema, you can also use that kind of has a way to um, share information. And there's a couple new open source thread modeling tools appearing up, so I would definitely also recommend um, them. Now, when you look at the execution, right, in terms of how you actually do it, there's kind of two worlds. We have a world of tools of automated scanners where you kind of press a button and go, and, and you can use it to for testing known vulnerabilities. And you can also have manual testing or tools that help you um, on on that manual test. Right. Um, in some ways, it's kind of like, you know, if you think you can buy a tool and press a button and, and get really um, valuable results, then, you know, you're living in a kind of a dream world, right? That, that kind of depends on a magical combination of events where people actually code the way the tools expect you to code and the applications develop on the way the tool vendors expect you to, to code, which kind of never happens in the real world. Now, does it mean that the tools don't have value? Well, Absolutely not. I, I think tools have spectacular value, but you need to customize them. You need to basically find ways to customize the tools, find ways to basically almost like leverage the human intelligence that you can apply to them. And in some ways, that's how you can scale. You really scale if you can kind of merge these two worlds, right, and, and basically be able to use these kind of tools from proxies and, and scanners, etc., cetera, with, with human intelligence so that you basically get, like, the best of both worlds, where you kind of are able to capture uh, what I like to call application security knowledge and workflows, where basically what you're really doing is you're capturing um, the workflow that was created to get to a particular point, to get to a particular um, type of vulnerability that um, the developers, you know, that was created. So, you know, in some ways, the way you do this, you, you kind of have to catch that script, and, and that allows you to replicate the bug, retest security vulnerabilities. It's really powerful for developers because they can replay it, they can use it to understand it. And also what you do is if you can put them as unit tests, that can go straight into the SDL, namely during the development and QA phases. Right? So that's also pretty powerful. And, and then that also allows developers to work with security teams so that, you know, you kind of better, you know, you build better application visualization tools during the engagement, and then you give them to developers. That's also something I'm pretty big on, because I really think that um, when we do a security engagement, we build a huge amount of tools. We build a huge amount, of, in some ways, of knowledge that we capture. If we can codify that knowledge and give it to developers, the developers love it because they have the same needs that we do. You know, a very simple example is, give me all the URLs of an application. Like, how can you even calculate the attack surface if you don't know the URLs? If you look at web services, is give me every single web service call that exists. Give me a mapping between the web services and uh, the authorization rules. Right? All that stuff is basically stuff that the developers also need, that the security consultants need themselves. And I'm going to show you guys some examples and, and how actually... That was also done um, in, in practice um, during, um, you know, uh, an, an engagement which I can show some details on. So, now, let, I, I'm going to fly through the OS top 10, right? Like, so, you know, I could spend an hour on this thing. I, I don't want to spend an hour because what I really want to do is I want to talk specifically about web server security, and I also want to uh, show you a bunch of demos. So, you know, sorry if, I, if I'm going to fly through some of these. But uh, there's, there's a, a really great, um, you know, book about this, you know, and the slides are going to be available, so feel free to um, to go and, and reference there. So the top ten, it's kind of like, uh, you know, a list created by OWASP, which is the Open Web Application Security Project, that talks about ten vulnerabilities that, that applications tend to have. Now, what's interesting about um, web services is that when you look at web services, kind of web services have just about every single one of these, right? So it's, in some ways, it's not because you move to web services world that you don't have um, some of these issues. And even th something like cross-site scripting, which is, you know, usually you need a browser to do it, you could put payloads um, through, um, uh, what's it called, 
you know, through the web service, that basically get consumed by somewhere else, where sometimes the web service just relays some exploits, which is, again, something you probably don't want to do from a web service point of view. And a little plug here, right, in Secure Innovation, we actually published um, a, a last top 10 course that we can give access to you guys. And also, we also have, um, uh, from Team Mentor, which is like this kind of knowledge base, there's a, a Team Mentor database for the OS top 10 that has a huge bunch of articles that is published under Creative Commons. So you guys can use it and you can share it, and there's some more details there at the end. Um, of the presentation. So let's go through this, right? So injection means that you can trigger an application executing any kind of commands that we send to them. Kind of, you know, simply put, this is, you know, SQL injection, LDAP injection, LDAP injections, expat, stuff like that, right? And unfortunately, SQL injection is still quite common um, because people still um, concatenate, you know, use basically um, the data that we receive directly from the outside world to build the SQL queries that basically get put directly into the database. And, and, and some of these can be pretty spectacular bad, you know, and, and you probably see the, the latest, you know, you know, recent attacks, for example, on, on Sony. Some of them were uh, using SQL injection where people downloaded the entire database um, remotely. But, but, but that, in some ways, that's, you know, sometimes not as bad as it could be because when you can execute commands on the web server, on the database, you probably can control the web server and you can do a huge amount of stuff um, um, to the, you know, to, to the actual server in question. So, in some ways, it's quite um, um, an issue. So, now, so here's a, here's a good example, right, of, of SQL injection, right? So, basically, you can see that, you know, we're using the data that comes from the outside world to actually... Um, to build a query that is then executed, and you kind of have this pattern in, um, in in all different places. You can have this for if you do, for example, um, step on the operating system. You know, basically this allows you to uh, execute commands on the operating system. LDAP is when you're actually hitting a, a, an LDAP database, etc. Now the second one is cross-site scripting, and, and kind of cross-site scripting is, you know, the way I look at it is kind of the, one of the sleeping giants of, of application security, because it's one of those that people kind of um, tend to sometimes ignore and think it's not as bad, but basically cross-site scripting is the buffer of the flows of the web world. It's basically allowing uh, the attacker to run commands on the, um, you know, on, on the victim's browser. Which, which has huge amount of impact because basically it means that once, if the attacker can put a payload on a web page and that is basically, uh, gets shown to the victim, that basically the attacker is able to issue any commands on that browser that the user can do. So at that stage, right, you can modify the links, you can modify the web page, you can do stuff on behalf of the user, you can basically, you know, uh, wait for the user to, to log in and to actually do something um, powerful and then um, and then basically, you know, um, modify, you know, the data out there. So it's, it's pretty, pretty bad. And it's also quite easy to create from a development point of view. So it's kind of why we, we tend to have this sort of everywhere. Um, so here's an example of, of how cross city works, where, you know, basically, you know, let's say the, um, you know, the, 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 the attacker sends a malicious script to the application, uh, the victim gets the resource, and that actually contains a malicious script, which is actually run um, from the victim and is sent to the attacker, right? Because you have to remember that once the malicious attacker can put a payload in there, he can basically execute stuff on the victim's browser, which is basically um, a, a big issue, right? So the next one is broken authentication and session management. Uh, and kind of, you know, what, what part of the problem here is that, you know, HTTP is what's called a stateless protocol, which basically means that there is no state within connections. So the only way the server can distinguish between user A and user B is by a little token that we actually give it to track, you know, who the user is. It basically means that most of the time the security is dependent on the, um, the quality of that session ID, which is basically a unique identifier. Now, one of the things that you should never do, you should never try to come up with your own authentication and session management system, because most of the time you will get it wrong. So you really should try to leverage the frameworks that you're coding on top of to, um, to basically, um, Use use it to um, you know hold 
hold your expectation. So when you're doing from, from a testing point of view, you want to make sure that, you know, first of all, you understand how they're doing it, which is sometimes not as straightforward, and B, you um, you find that if, if what, you know, if, if the keys used or if the unique identifier is used to actually track state are really unique or they actually are not as random as they could be or if they're using, um, um, you know, something else that you can basically bypass. And so in some ways, uh, one of the problems with local authentication is that, you know, again, you, you can have access to other users' accounts and you can basically, um, you know, com compromise the users of your system. Uh, an interesting side effect of also this is the fact that you have to make sure that you also, you know, handle proper things like change my password, remember my password, etc. because a lot of them will allow you to brute forcing attacks or will allow an attacker to basically replace, for example, a password without knowing the other one, which is a really bad thing because, you know, there's another attack here called the cross site request forgery that becomes really bad if, for example, you, you don't ask for the password before you change for the new one. And... Um, um, he saw a very simple example of broken authentication where, uh, you know, basically the, the user sends the credentials to the, you know, in this case, to the website. He rewrites, you know, and the, the session basically puts in, um, you know, the J session ID on the URL. And you can see that basically if they're using URLs, it kind of like, you know, he puts the, the, you know, let's say he clicks on a link to the hacker.com forum, the referrer contains the link where you came from, which basically means now you just grab the session ID um, from that particular user, right? This is a good example where you don't really want to store your cookies, or sorry, your, your unique identifiers on URLs because they tend to leak and they tend to basically uh, be easily uh, captured from all sorts of different places. So the next one is insecure direct object references. And now this is a it's, it's a it's a pretty pretty tough one because what, what you're actually doing here is basically you you are you know I'll say the developers are, are using object references that were given to them by the attackers. Uh, a very a very good example of this is, for example, if if you ask for user for a, an account number. So you basically say, okay, I have, you know, I want to show you your accounts. Uh, give me your, uh, give me the account number that you want to see. That's a really bad idea because what, basically if the attacker is able to basically say, okay, here is another account number, now you're basically going to have to make sure that that account number um, is not, uh, doesn't belong from, from somebody else. And, and, you know, a much better way is to only say you have three accounts and basically, you know, which account do you want? Do you want account one, two, or three? So from a, from a testing point of view, when you're actually trying to break an application, one of the things that you always, you know, kind of go laser sharp on is on, you know, the kind of data that is flying back and forward the application. So if you see unique identifiers, if you see things like account IDs, you can see like internal references, file paths, even, you know, DLLs or URLs, you kind of know that that could be a potential um, source of, of vulnerabilities because it means that the server side is asking the client, which of course the attacker controls, uh, what internal resource does he want to receive. Um, and basically, you know, in fact, there was, I think, again, a recent vulnerability where somebody was able to access uh, you know, a website, all the accounts by simply modifying the ID of the account that was being viewed, right? And this can be pretty bad if you have, you know, pretty, you know, sensitive assets on the other side and basically, um, you, you have a situation where the, um, you know, you know, a user A shouldn't be able to see stuff from user B. So here's a simple example, right? Modifies the account parameter from 65 to 66 and then you can see the victim information. Right. This is actually way, way more common than uh, than you might think of. And in fact, you know, one of the vulnerabilities I want to cover later is, is on the Spring MVC, the, the auto binding stuff. This is a big issue there, right? Because you can access uh, internal object references, uh, which might not be exposed on the outside world, but the framework allows you to bind internally. So um, now the cross site request forgery. It's another one of those vulnerabilities that, in some ways. It was created by the way the web is designed. So if, if, you, if you think about it, you know, the way the web works is you're able to, you know, from a website A, you're able to get a resource.
from website B. So what it actually means is that when you go to website A, you actually are um, grabbing a resource. So if you look here, when I'm on website A, I'm actually able to, for example, grab an image or something from another website, uh, and that shows nicely. The problem you have is, is your browser, although your browser will prevent website A from viewing content from website B, the requests will go through with whatever cookies you actually have happen to have on the other website. So basically what this means is that you can be visiting a website in one place and be making a request to a completely different website, and if that request happens to trigger an action, then that could be a pretty serious vulnerability, right? And in, in some ways, you know, let's say there's a website that says, oh, I can, you know, make transfer from account A to account B for this amount. If, you, if that's all it takes to make a transfer, then basically you can be, be visiting any website and be making transfers from um, your, um, you know, your account in, in, in a particular banking site. And web services are also pretty bad at this because some web services you can invoke directly uh, from get requests, or from, uh, um, which basically means that you can actually also um, trigger this kind of vulnerability from a, a different website. And, 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 and this is a tough one because in order to protect it, the only really proper way to protect against cross site request forgery is, um, is when you are able to um, provide a, a, a kind of a token that um, you give the users um, before they do an action. So it, it's kind of tricky because if you don't see these tokens flying back and forward, you kind of know that the application most likely is going to be vulnerable to uh, cross site request forgery. Um, and again, web services are, are vulnerable to this. Uh, well, some of them. Some, some, some try to protect this, but, you know, and, and then a lot of it actually depends on the browsers uh, to enforce the, the security. Now, um, another, another one that, you know, still affects a lot of people is basically security configuration. And what it means is that, you know, kind of, you know, application sits on top, right, of the network, of a host service, et cetera. If that thing is not properly secured and locked down, then you can also have a huge amount of vulnerabilities. And, um, you know, and, and again, the other thing that, you know, be having proper secure configuration on the server side, it means that you have some containment between, between uh, websites. Uh, it's kind of very typical on a lot of, um, you know, big server farms or big companies that you have really nicely protected applications that are sitting on the same servers or in the same location as really vulnerable applications. And once those of our applications gets compromised, let's say a marketing website or some brochureware or some, you know, um, you know, internal thing that happened to be exposed, then you can go from there and hit the main website. So again, it's kind of crit critical that application, you know, you know so security um, is also applied to the server, to the services running on it, to, you know, lock it down with firewalls, et cetera, to make sure that uh, the impact of a compromise is also um, quite, you know, limited. Like, for example, on this example here, you can see that, um, you know, the attacker, right, you know, once, once he's inside, he can hit all sorts of other things because it's actually uh, able to uh, access it. And so I would argue that, you know, basically some of the development systems should be really well protected, right? Your QA servers should not be able to QA people. The development should be locked down, the test, and then also the source control, absolutely, your crown rules. You know, if you allow, you know, if you don't protect your source control systems, then basically that's the best place to put backdoors and to attack your, your company without you even noticing, right? And, and with the attacker being able to basically say it was not him because it's done maybe in the name of somebody else. So uh, a kind of a common vulnerability, especially when um, you know, basically people try to create authorization systems based on URLs, is, is this kind of concept of, um, of, of URL access. So basically the idea is that you're using an authorization model that is based on URLs. So depending on which URL you hit, depending on your privilege, you have access or not. And um, this is kind of uh, really hard to do unless you have a really good visualization. And, and basically, in some ways, you, you sometimes is applying security much up in the food chain where you really want to make a lot of your security checks um, much further, further down in your code. And it also, the other thing that I really don't like about, you know, a lot of, a lot of the way this tends to be done is that you sometimes have good sort of, 
per role security, which basically means, let's say, an admin, a, a, an editor cannot see pages from admin, a, a, a viewer cannot see pages from an editor, but once you are editor, there is nothing that limits one user from the other, which basically means that once you can edit, you know, a user A can edit stuff from user B. So, because in some ways the protection was, can the editor access this page, not just um, can he, um, you know, uh, is he authorized to do something else? So, um, the other thing that is also important to, on, on the real access is, is sometimes there's, there's a lot of security that is built by obscurity, which is kind of where you have security that um, basically uh, what you do is people say, well, this link is never connected to the outside world, so it's okay because nobody's going to find it, you know. Of course, that there's tools to do that, there's ways to figure out, and also you, depending on having nothing that leaks anything from your source code, because what it does, you can try to find what else exists in there. So, again, it's really, you know, something that you need to be checked, and, and basically, the way I look at it is, is if you can create a grid that has um, all your mappings and all your roles and all your URLs, you're going to have vulnerabilities because it's really hard to curl this up without being able to map it to the business requirements and to actually what the application is actually doing. So here's a good example, right? You basically you can see there's a get accounts and there's also not being get accounts and manager get accounts. So, you know, some of this stuff can actually be predicted. And there's a great dictionary out there from the from Deer Buster, which is actually uh, uh, the last project. And, and basically what, what it was done was the kind of – uh, uh, the guy did he crawl, hop the internet, and he basically created a database of all the type of words that people tend to use to create directories. And that was pretty spectacular because it's amazing how much the actual guess of directories that exist that people don't think you should be able to have access to. Another one that, you know, can be bite you pretty hard is invalidated uh, redirects and forwards, which basically is a case where uh, a, a website redirects you from one side to the other, um, which kind of can, can basically um, allow, could allow an attacker to send victims to a website that they control. Uh, let's say a good example is that if you have a, a social media website, if you allow um, a redirect, somebody may redirect to a page that looks like the login page of that website, and, and the user never noticed because the link actually was from the original website, but now you end up on somebody else. Right? It basically, it's kind of common uh, data cleanage, right? You don't want to be linking to stuff or sending to things that um, you don't know, and you want to control where the user goes to. And, and, and the other part of this is that some frameworks, uh, for example, internal transfers in .NET uh, and also like Spring Framework, you, you can actually have a case where um, you also can send internal forwards, which basically means that you bypass or a lot of the times the internal authorization models, and you just load up a page from the inside. In fact, one of the examples I want to show you on Hamby Bank has this exact problem, where it actually uses a value from the outside world to actually map the, the control that gets loaded, which basically means that, you know, that creates a, a, an application uh, security vulnerability because you can access controls that you shouldn't be able to because you can load them directly. Um, and it's basically almost like an internal redirect. So finally, you know, there's three more, insecure cryptography storage, right? It's kind of like, you know, basically it's, it's failing to store sensitive data. And, and I'll, I'll go back to my, one of my first points. You first have to know where your assets are so you know how to store them safely. Uh, it's very important to know where they exist. You know, credit card information is pretty obvious, but, you know, user data, things that have session, things that are part of the assets that the application is supposed to be managing, you really need to know where they are. You need to know the places where it touches, the database, the files, directory, etc., and then you need to properly uh, protect it. Right, and, and and again, like you know, this is something that um, more and more, like you know, data becoming really valuable. That's just something that um, the attacks are, are going to, are, are basically going for. So again, if you don't store it in a secure way, you are basically really opening up yourself to a lot, a much bigger attack uh, surface than you would otherwise. And if you guys build anything to do with the cloud or cloud-based solutions, you really want to be in a position where if one person gets compromised, you, you cannot, or one account gets compromised, or there's a code executing under one account on the server side, you cannot see other people's accounts, right? Basically, you need to be sure that you can isolate that, and cryptography is a great way um, to do that. So you can basically protect data while in, in storage, and 
and not just data in transit, which is kind of the other thing you need to do, which is basically, uh, which is the last one, is basically um, the, the one where you don't send it protectively, which is the insufficient, insufficient transport layer protection. Uh, just a little example on the previous one, you put the credit card there, you actually put uh, the details, for example, locally, and the accessible, and then, you know, somebody steals a lot, a lot of data. You know, I actually seen this on an application where they had a debug mode that you could trigger remotely, which basically you can say, by the way, log everything locally, and that would log all the credit card stuff, which, which was not good. So the final one on this one is, is basically sufficient transport layer protection, which basically means kind of no SSL. But, but also it's, it's more than that because, you know, the, the application today is have lots of moving parts. So you really want to make sure that as data flies back and forward, you want to make sure that um, that is actually um, um, properly um, sent and received. Right? You know, and, and this way there's a lot of, you know, back channels, a lot of ways an application can be talking to the server and I can be talking to other applications. So you really need to understand those connections and make sure that that whole thing is protected. And it doesn't really help that SSL is pretty spectacularly broken. So um, you, you, you really should be looking at new stuff like convergence and some of the other things that are happening to really try to find better ways to, to protect your data from, from, you know, from the client to the server and from, from, from multiple places. And when we talk about web services, it's really important to understand that the web service tends to communicate with each other and a lot of that, that really needs to be protected. That really should be encrypted because somebody who can listen to that information can gather a huge amount of important data. So uh, here's just a quick thing, you know, basically the external victim, you know, custom credit backend systems. You can see that there's all these different places where you can actually be trying to grab the data uh, from the, um, you know, the, the victim. So now let, let's look at web service security. Let me see if I can change this to another box because I want to I start talking about web services security, so just a quick second. And let me know if you have uh, any questions. And uh, I'm just going to shift here to another presenter. Another, here we go. share my desktop. All right. So hopefully you guys can see Yeah, I, there's a question here to share the slides via the handouts. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's during or after. Uh, we will um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put this, we'll basically we'll send an email with, with to everybody or, or put available the, the email to download all the, um, all the, the slides. So, um, Ma Maureen did, can, can send you guys and uh, the slides. I'm not, not sure if you can put them available already during the, um, this, this session, but if, they, if we can, then we'll, we'll put it available for you guys. So, okay. So, there you go. You can see that. So, so basically, you should be able to see um, my desktop here, and here we go. All right. So, so what, what I want to show you, you is, um, let me see. Hope, hopefully, it's not too big um, of a screen. You guys can see that. And um, uh, what, what, what I want to show you is, is basically. The, I, I want to now start talking a little bit about web services security, right? And, and basically, and, and the thing about web services is that, you know, a lot of the stuff I talked before was, uh, was to do with web applications. And, and web services tend to just be, you know, a kind of interface that people connect to. It tends to be, you know, some kind of uh, website that it kind of exposes information to. And, and what's important? Right, to see is that basically the web services, if we look at from an attacker's point of view, right, the, the web services have basically all these, uh, you know, it, it still has a lot of the same issues, right? So if you guys can see here, so I hope you guys can read that, right? 
he still has things like Ajax injections, Cybertex, plain text attacks, commando injections, cross request forgery, cross touch scripting, uh, file main, phishing, stiff memory, uh, SQL injections, statistical URL directions. So a lot of this stuff also applies to the web services, right? And, and it's kind of like, sometimes it's not as obvious because the web service uh, tends to sometimes just look like this. this is the second, um, where is my web services for well, having things? Uh, this one. So, no, no, sorry, not that one. So usually the, the web services will will kind of tend to look like like this. Uh, one. I got it here. I need to start it. Sorry. It helps if I have to start the web services. There you go. Alright. So, so the, the, the thing you guys have to get your head around the web services is the web services are most of the time are basically an API to your code. Right? It's basically, it's like a motorway to your, your application, which basically introduces a, a huge amount of vulnerabilities because most web services were not designed to be exposed to the outside world, which basically means that they, they have functionality that uh, was not designed to be exposed to um, a malicious attacker and basically, you know, introduces situations where, um, oh, here we go, sorry, um, that, you know, you have all sorts of vulnerabilities that now occur. So, if you look, so this is Hatme Bank, right? So, Web services kind of looks like this, right? Which of course is sort of the first public vulnerability is because you don't want to be giving in some way the attacker on, on a plate, um, or, or the, um, you know, the, the way the application works. So, you know, you can see here, right? This is a kind of a typical web server where basically you have all sorts of functionality that is now being, uh, exposed. To, to basically um, the outside world, and, and basically it's really hardcore business functionality. Things from create account, execute SQL statements, right? Uh, loan rates, etc. cetera. Like clearly this one is an admin one, right? You know, if an attacker can actually, you know, invoke the execute SQL query, that's basically SQL injection, right? And you can see transfer funds, request a loan, et cetera. So uh, basically you can see that, you know, like, this, and, and when if you look at one of these, right, it's basically, um, you know, you're providing input into the, um, the application is all that data is going to fly through the server, right, and is basically going to be exposed um, internally, and you have to be able to handle it properly. So if you, if you go back to the kind of stuff that could happen, right, for example, you can have things like command injection, right, where, you know, you can basically use, um, you know, like you can put an exploit in there that kind of, you know, is going to execute something on, on the server side. And, uh, so here, here's an example of, like, say, on, on, um, on the, on, you can see that, 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 there was a, a cat command that prints out to the, uh, like that example there, right? If you basically you could see this case actually using kind of a C++ example, what you actually have is, is a case where, um, you know, we actually are writing to the file system um, from from a web service, and and this is actually something that is very common. So it's very common to have you know, let's say a C plus plus wrapper that eventually oh, okay. So this, this, this there you go, string copy, string cat, system there you go. So could be better from okay. So so if you see there, you actually have a case where uh, oh, I'm just refreshing. Um, you actually have a case where basically the the, the, the user provided input is actually uh, used to to do something on a, on a file system and and in this case it's interesting because it's actually C plus plus which is also very very common and actually means that now a whole range of vulnerabilities uh, get introduced from you know because you know you can have no pointers you can have uh, character um, you know no characters to allow you to access other stuff so you know, there's a whole raft of vulnerabilities that can be introduced that you might not think of because it's really deep down 
into your your application. So, so web services, in some ways, uh, I, I like to think of them as they basically motorways into your application business logic. They basically really uh, allow um, you know the attacker to have internal access to what's happening uh, on the back end and actually what's happening um, on the on the server side. So for the first example, the practical example I want to talk to you about is uh, on, on Happy Bank. So what I have here is basically Happy Bank is a vulnerable by design application, right? So, and, and this is kind of using, you know, what, you know what I was talking about, you have to automate application security knowledge. Well, so this is kind of what it looks like. This is actually using the O2 platform, um, which I'm one of the developers. And, and basically this allows me to automate like the, the start of servers, to automate the business logic of the application. So you can see here that I'm actually able to log in, um, you know, login fails. So then I can basically do a proper login, um, which is kind of this one. So you can see now I'm going to be successfully able to log in to the application. Um, so now I've got, I have a vulnerability, uh, an SQL injection. So now I can trigger an SQL injection uh, on basically the, um, the server side, and, and basically, what you, you know, and, and you can see that it's a multiple step. You actually have to go through the, you know, the login, and then I have to do the accounts, and then basically I have to click on uh, and put my payload on the actual account uh, submission details. And there, there's my database error. So what this basically means is that um, I actually was able to put uh, some data that actually went to the server side and actually uh, corrupted the, um, the database, right, the database call. And, and what, what thinking about, for example, this error message, like look up, talk, talk about leaking information, right? You can see that, yes, my information came from an SQL connection error. But if you start to, like, look up on the kind of the call stack, you see that basically what I have here is this kind of SQL engine, right, which kind of, enough to give me a clue that actually this is a web service. So what, what you actually have here is you actually have a, a web service that is basically executing this, and you basically can see where it ends up, which is basically on the account management. Well, right? on this case, the ASMX, which is basically the web service's call. So you can see that even just this fact trace will already leak a huge amount of data on on the you know from from an attack point of view that can be used to build up the, um, this. Uh, kind of vulnerability. And, and, and in this case, for example, what you actually have is I can ex directly access the web service, as you guys saw here, So, which basically means that, you know, it's actually another vulnerability on, on this one is because of the fact that I should not be able to access internal web services directly. So, again, that's something that we look at security configuration. This particular uh, URL should be protected, so I shouldn't be able to access these internal web services directly from, from the outside world. Now, here's a, another interesting vulnerability where I can use SQL injection to bypass the authorization. And this is where sometimes it's important to know the assets because sometimes this is as bad as being able to do download the data from the database. Because, for example, from a business point of view, uh, if you have a business that says, well, I really, really care about uh, knowing that the user and only that user was able to do a particular action, but I don't care that much if that data is, is revealed, then this is a big issue because I can log in as somebody else without knowing their password. So ironically, I, I found that sometimes customers have a bigger uh, high you know, risk threshold for something like immediate SQL injection, but very low when they realize, well, actually that means in their application. Right. So uh, another interesting vulnerability that you have here is um, is a vulnerability on on basically um, uh, accessing another user's account. So if you look at what's going to happen here, I'm going to go into users, a particular user, and what's happening is I'm going to see somebody else's account. So what you just saw there, if I replay that, you'll see that basically I I, I go as in Joe Viella. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to be able to see another user. I'm going to see another user account. So the first one you see is that user. The second one is actually somebody else's uh, information. And, and the way that works, and, and this is a good example to actually show the code that's powering this, is if you look at the code that it triggers that exploit, you should kind of be able to read this. So if you look at um, this code here, um, what, what it means 
is that, you know, you, you grab the first URL, you log in with a username and password, you click submit, right? And there's my submit button. Then you click on the admin section, and then you basically grab, oh, sorry, that one there. Then you go to the my account, so same thing, but kind of different steps. So you click on the submit there, you click on my accounts, you basically click on the view transactions, and then basically you grab the URL there, and you replace one account number by another account number. And you can see they actually are predictable. Again, if you go back to the indirect references, here's a case where uh, I'm actually able to um, connect, you know, from, from this guy I'm able to actually, um, you know, predict what's going to be the next account. Right, and then I just open that up, and then I can basically gain access to somebody else's account. Uh, and another um, interesting vulnerability that happens here is basically when you actually leak data to uh, the, to the client without particularly sometimes knowing that you can do that. So here's on this example is example where the animation is going to play and basically go to the ad and figure out what is the admin password for the uh, the admin section, and the way that works is basically you can see if I replay that, you can see that, you know, I go to the, the login page, I log in, I go to the admin section, and then there's a, a challenge, which basically means there's a unique response, and I'm able to log in. Uh, the vulnerability on this one is that the, the actual um, response is leaked uh, into the view state. So if you look at the exploit, the exploit is here, where basically after I click on the admin section, I'm able to go into the view state, and then I, gra I grab the 12th value, and then I actually put that as you know on the data, and I just submit it, right? So uh, here's a good example of the kind of, of things that you can basically do um, with um, you know, when when you automate the 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 security, um, you know, exploits. And this is a good example of a kind of vulnerability that has multi-steps that you actually are using assets that the application leaks to access it. So what's interesting about this is now that we have access to the, the admin pages, right? So here's an example, right? So here's, here's the admin pages um, for, for the server side. In some ways, the, the, the interesting question becomes what happens if a normal user is able to, to basically access an admin page. So basically, the question is, what happens if I, as a normal user, um, go here, right, uh, log in uh, into Happy Bank, and then, and then basically, um, so if I if I log in using the SQL injection, right, just to make it faster, right. So you can see I'm logged in as a user. But what happens if I? Can you see that function welcome at the top? What happens if I replace that with uh, the, for example, an admin control, right? So now what happens, you can see that I was actually able to, okay, second, uh, JP, let's again, I think it's because I, I shift from localhost to, uh, okay, here we go. So, so you can see that now, you know, I'm still logged in as a normal user. You can see that I don't have the admin section, which you can see here. You can see when I'm logged in as an admin, you can see that there's a little, Admin section there. Um, basically, what I can do here is basically uh, access the admin section directly from here, right? And, uh, and again, this is this is a typical common vulnerability because uh, you are able to uh, access, you know, an internal function directly from uh, a, a user base. And and, and the, the part that I want to kind of trickle all down to the web services is that a lot of this functionality is triggered. Uh, from the web services. So you have to be able to build things like this. So well, one of the things I've done you know, as part of team, you know, SI is I worked on Team Mentor, right? And one of the things I've done for Team Mentor is I built uh, a, a unit test framework that was actually you know, basically designed from a, secure, from a usability point of view that allowed me to test the security. So here's, for example, what I mean by this. It means that I'm able to run unit tests that tests for all the security of all the web services that exist on Team Mentor. So all of these are web services that do stuff. And then you can see that I can test them very quickly with uh, a normal user, and and also I can test them as as basically um, an anonymous user. And and what that means is that I, I expect the anonymous user to look like this. 
because I expect the anonymous user not to be able to do anything here and I, the way that I expect an admin to be able to do. And, and what's important is when you take this to the next level, one of the things that you have to be able to do is you have to be able to build mappings like the one I'm going to show you next. So if somebody, uh, and this is a fine example because we're kind of running out of time, but the, 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 every time you talk about authorization and you talk about web services, if somebody cannot show you a map that basically looks like this, that has the, the, the privileges mapped uh, based on, for example, uh, user privilege, that you, that you don't have mappings that shows, well, these are all the web services that the admin can do. These are all the web services that the, read, the reader can do. These are all the web services that Anonymous can do, right, and basically build graphs like, let's say, that one here, where it shows them side by side. So here's the way you read this one. Is, I know it looks a bit messy, but it's kind of like in green are the ones that you can access anonymously. The, the light red are the vulnerabilities, and, and the blue are the okay ones. So you can see that in the left I have anonymous, in the middle I have user, in the right I have admin, and basically means that the normal user can access one of those functions that I wasn't expecting to. So if, you, if somebody cannot give you this, basically where you have a mapping between all the functions and all the roles, then you're going to be in trouble because it's going to be really, really hard to actually um, build basically, you know, uh, develop securely, and it's going to be really hard to basically protect everything. Okay, so let's go back into uh, my slides, and hopefully you guys can see my slides now. Um, let's see if I got that. Yep, so let's just wrap up now. So basically I've done my demos, right? You guys seen the demos. Um, and so here, here's kind of the, <coughs> the conclusion. Um, <coughs> so I go back to, to my first point, right? Really learn as much as possible about technologies, understand how the application works, understand the attack surface, find the assets, not the asserts, uh, map the company risk profile, focus on how the app works, optimize security knowledge, and then find ways to make it invisible to developers. And uh, here's like a presentation I've done last week in Brazil, or two weeks ago, which I really think is a, I really hit a nerve on the developers, and, and basically it's about how to make security invisible by becoming developer's best friend, what I try to present it from a developer's point of view. And um, basically, uh, you know, a little thing about security innovation, we got team professor, which are e-learning, we got a team mentor, which I'll show you a bit, we do code review and pen testing and application risk management, so again, you know, we kind of are here to help. And, and basically, there's, you know, if you ping the, the guys from team, from SI, they, you know, there's like a couple of, there's the, the, the free OWASP version that you can connect, and they also will give you a free learning course if you can have, have a play with it, and basically, um, uh, you know, have a go at, uh, and learn about, more about the OWASP top 10. So, uh, any final questions? Uh, actually, can I? Maureen, how do I unmute this? Unmute everybody. Is it it's structure? No. Um, so I don't know if you guys have any any final questions. Not sure how I